Good morning. Welcome to Bethesda Church this morning. I'm your pastor, Paul Prather. I'm so glad that you joined with us today. I'm going to talk in just a few minutes about our seven basic human needs and how the Lord, in His way, has made provision to fulfill each of our basic needs if we'll let Him. Before we do that, I need to make some announcements. Uh, one announcement is our leadership met this week, and thank God we have decided to go back to live in-person services uh, on March the 28th, uh, exactly a month from today. Church members, be watching your email. I sent out a letter uh, Friday to the church talking about this, and there will be more updates as we get closer to the time, and one of the things that I'm excited about this getting back together is when we get back together I won't be doing the announcements anymore. Uh, Stacy will be back to do those and praise the Lord for that. <laughs> so anyway I can just get right to my sermon then but anyway I'm so excited about uh, us going back to church and we will continue um, to do the Facebook live sermons. Many of you have asked will we still be doing these Yes, we will, because there are so many people who watch these and so many people for whom this is their main way of worshiping. I know because they've contacted me and, and told me. So we're going to find a way to keep doing that for everybody who wants that. Second announcement is we have music today on my Facebook page, Paul Prather uh, on Facebook or Bethesda Church, Mount Sterling on Facebook. Jim Bean and John Prather have posted songs already, and you can go over when the sermon is over and watch those. And I'm sure they will bless you. As I ask you every Sunday, please share uh, this sermon on your Facebook page, and this helps to get the word out to those who might need to hear what we're talking about here and don't even know they need to hear it. But you've got friends who have friends who have friends, and so... Just put the word out there, and if somebody doesn't want it, doesn't like it, doesn't want to watch it, that's fine. Maybe God didn't have that word for them, but there may be somebody out there who's hurting, who needs uh, a word from the Lord, and it may be this week, this word. So sharing that. Also, Paul Perdon and Katie Henson have opened up a Facebook channel for us to archive the past sermons that I've done on Facebook and our past music. And if you would like to check that out on Facebook, it is at Bethesda Church, Mount Sterling, Kentucky. I'll say that again. Bethesda Church, Mount Sterling, Kentucky. Just type that into the search line on Facebook. Should take you right to us. They're adding new stuff to that all the time. So go over the, and check that out. And I thank Paul and Katie for doing that. And then finally, this is Communion Sunday. It was supposed to be last Sunday, and the weather was so bad, uh, Team Spencer couldn't get out and, uh, and get the communion to everybody. We've got some people that live in far-flung places, so we're doing communion today. And at the close of the sermon, we will celebrate communion together. If you're a member of the church, you should have gotten your kit. If you're not a member of our church and you want to celebrate with us, uh, Gather together your your elements uh, real quickly, and you're welcome to celebrate with us. Okay, those are the announcements, and uh, I'm so glad to be with you today, and I want to go to the Lord in prayer now, and then we will get right on with the, with the sermon. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for bringing us here together this morning. And I ask you that as we share the word, that you would anoint me and that the words that I speak would not be mine but yours, that they'd be spirit and truth and would not return void, but would accomplish what you sent them to do. Lord, give us listening ears and open hearts to receive your word, and I praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I'm getting a little notice over here on my Facebook that there's something wrong with the time. Uh, it says I've been on for 25 minutes, so I don't know what's going on here, but hopefully this tape will turn out okay, and hopefully some of you are here 
with me this morning and you can hear what I'm saying. Um, this morning I want to talk about the seven fundamental human needs and how God can fulfill all of our seven most basic needs in life. What brought me to this is this. Um, I was thinking, I used to work at the newspaper <clears throat> with a sports columnist who from time to time would write a column that he called Things I Learned While Looking Up Something Else. I always loved that concept. And this sermon is something that I came across while looking up something else this week. I was uh, searching for, for something and came across a website that was about our seven basic human needs. And it wasn't written specifically from a Christian perspective, although I think the guy who does the, the, the website seems to be a Christian. But I was just scrolling through these seven needs, and it occurred to me that each of these matches up with promises in the Bible about what God will do for us. And that if there are seven basic human needs, according to psychologists, uh, such as Victor Maslow, I think Victor was his name, Maslow anyway, in his hierarchy of needs. He later added an eighth one, I believe. But if there are seven or eight or however many basic human needs, somehow the writers of the New Testament anticipated all of these 2,000 years ago and because human nature really hasn't changed much. And they were perceptive enough, probably through the Holy Spirit, to know that we needed these things. We needed these areas of our lives fulfilled. And they wanted to show us how the Lord is the answer to each need. And that, that's what came to me. So what I'm going to do this morning is briefly run through each of these seven basic human needs that everybody has and then try to explain how the Lord has made provision to meet each one of these. The website I was on, just for the record, you can go look it up. I don't endorse it or not endorse it. It's something I came across on the internet, but it rang a bell with other things of this nature I've seen in the past. The website was called Kenneth, Kenneth MD Prescriptions for Greatness. The author of the website or the keeper of the website is a guy named Kenneth Aka, A-C-H-A, who is a family physician and uh, promotes healthy living and all that. I, as I said, I think he's also a Christian. But he was talking about these seven needs. And he said this, this is a quote from him, when many people suffer from depression and anxiety, they eat more and become obese. He was talking about weight control as one of the manifestations of this. And he says, stress is linked to all kinds of diseases that take patients to the doctor's office. I coach all my overweight and obese patients to seek to satisfy their seven fundamental human needs. That is a key part of effective weight loss and maintenance. And I think this is, is probably true, and it's true not just for weight loss, but for all kinds of issues that we face. The lack of fulfillment of these basic needs uh, excuse me, <clears throat> causes hurts, anger, disappointments, uh, illnesses, discontent, lack of purpose. I mean, every you've heard the saying, not original with me, obviously, that every person is born with a God-shaped hole in his or her heart. And the only one who can fill that void is God. And this m manifests itself in a need for several different things in life. And ultimately, to me, the only one who can meet all seven of these needs is the Lord. So that's my introduction. And let me just go on now with the seven fundamental human needs as delineated by Kenneth Aka. There are various forms of this list by different people, but but it started, this idea started, I believe, uh, in psychology, like with Maslow and, and some of these others. 
So bear with me here and we will walk through seven needs that you have. And if you think about it, you'll recognize yourself in here that you have these needs. And then we'll talk about how the Lord fulfills each of these. Number one is the need for subsistence. Subsistence. That is the need for survival, safety, security, self-care, structure, and control. Subsistence means just having enough of the basics to live on. That's what subsistence is. You know, having enough food to eat, having clothes to put on. Everybody has a need for subsistence. And it, it struck me that just recently in a sermon, you know, I preached, and I'm not going to belabor this one a whole lot because I just preached on this, but I've talked about the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the things that Jesus talks about is quit worrying about what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will put on, where you will, you know, find clothing or all of that. He says that's what the world worries about. But if you look at the flowers of in the fields, even Solomon in all of his glory wasn't clothed like them. And and look at the look at the birds of the air. They don't toil or spin, and yet somehow God feeds them. And you are worth much more than the sparrows in the sky and all the other birds. And if God so arrays the grass of the field, and if God feeds the sparrows, he will take care of you. And so God's way of dealing with our need for subsistence is to become our provision himself. He becomes our provider. I tell the people at uh, Bethesda, sometimes when we get off on a subject like this, that, you know, wherever you work, whatever your job is, how great or small your job is, your boss is not really your provider. Your company is not your provider. God is your provider. And that's why you don't have to worry and fret so much about what happens with your company or what kind of report your boss gives you, uh, job report, job evaluation. Yeah, I mean, we're supposed to work hard. We're not supposed to just be people pleasers. We're supposed to do our work as unto God. I'm not saying be a... a a lazy, cranky bum that nobody can get along with. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying do your work the best you can. Do your work as unto the Lord, but don't worry about what's going on with the economy. Don't worry about what, you know, the bosses say the company profits are going to look like next month or all of that, you know, because your job, your provision is not dependent on those things. God got you that job. God can get you another job. God can provide for you through the middle of a depression. God fed Elijah. The ravens of the air flew in and brought him food. I mean, God can create something out of nothing. And you should do the best you can, and you should work, and you should do your best to provide for yourself and your family, no question about it. But ultimately, God is the provider. And when we have faith in him as our provider, he comes through. When we when we let him, when we just sometimes just get out of his way, he will provide. And many times we'll provide better than anybody else can provide for us. And many times we'll provide virtually miraculously. I've seen it over and over and over and over during my 40 some years as a as a Christian and a minister God meets our subsistence needs okay second second thing everyone has a need for understanding and growth or what is called sometimes up growth that's the need to learn understand develop competence and become all you can be, as I think the Army says in one of their TV ads, be all that you can be. Well, everybody has a need to grow and, and learn and mature and, and progress in life. You know, we as Christians are to have those needs met through the Lord. The scriptures tell us that he has revealed to us 
that mysteries that were hidden from kings and prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, he has given us the mind of Christ, another place says. St. Paul says more than once that he wants us to grow up in all respects into the Lord. And so God is very much in favor of, and if we let him be, he is the author of growth, okay? But the real growth, the most powerful growth is spiritual growth. And that's the main way we grow in him. Now, he will show us things intellectually. He will improve our way of understanding the world and all those things. But primarily, he wants to grow us up into him and unto him because as we understand him, we begin to understand all kinds of things that much of the world longs to look into that fulfills us and sets us free. The third need is the need for connection and love. This is the need for belonging, identity, care, acceptance, and community. Well, our God that we serve is love. That is the essence of who he is. St. John said, God is love. And Jesus said, I have called you to not only love me and to be loved by me, but I have called you to love one another and even to love your uh, neighbors and strangers to manifest true agape love. And as we do that, we begin to find ourselves in a community, mainly the church, a community and a communion of believers who become our family, our brothers and sisters, our parents in the Lord. God gives us loving relationships, and he gives us those. Sometimes he gives them to people who've never had that in this world. Down through the years, I have many times had people tell me in the church that they came from backgrounds, you know, troubled families and all that. And they, they'll say, the church has become my family. I'm closer to my brothers and sisters in the Lord, in fact, than I am to my own brothers and sisters. And that's God's way of fulfilling that, that deep, pressing need for connection and love. Together we are the very family of God, the brothers and sisters of Jesus himself, who is described as our elder brother, and, and the sons and daughters of God, who is our Abba, that is, Daddy, Father. He becomes a father to us. We have communion and love in the fellowship of the household of God. Isn't that great? Um, the fourth need people have is the need for contribution. That is not to get, you know, a gift from somebody, not somebody making a contribution to you. We have the need to contribute, care, and serve to make the world around us better. All right. Everybody wants to feel like they're doing something important that is making the world around them better. Well, we're studying Ephesians in our Wednesday night Bible study, and one of the things that Ephesians talks about is that God created us for good works, which he himself prepared beforehand that we will walk in them. In other words, that God is in charge of making us contributors to the betterment of the world, that he, he has works prepared for you that he prepared before you even came along specifically for you to do. And if you turn to him and you walk with him, he will enable you to do those good things that he prepared you to do, which will give your life meaning. You know, as the body of Christ, we are the hands and feet of God. And we are sent out, St. Paul says again, to reconcile the world to God. We are sent out to heal the sick, whether that's supporting hospitals or becoming doctors, or sometimes people have a, a supernatural gift of being able to pray for people and, and many people get healed. But we're to he however we do it, we're to heal the sick, feed the hungry, visit the lonely, 
and make a contribution every day to the betterment of the world. That's God's way of going about that. The fifth need that we have is the need for esteem and identity, the, the need for respect, recognition, status, self-esteem, and identity. He has placed within, God has placed within each one of us the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, now lives within us. And if that's not a place for esteem and identity, I don't know what is when we realize that God himself is living in us and working through us. In Ephesians, which we're studying, the scripture says, and this is a mystery I can't fully understand myself, he has raised us up with Jesus and seated us in heaven in Christ Jesus at God's right hand. We are, we are as I said before, God's children and fellow heirs with Jesus Christ. And finally, someday we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which is in the Greek is a word called bema. People translate judgment seat as this awful thing. You're going to go up there and God's going to yell at you and fuss at you in front of the whole universe and all the heavenly hosts. That's not what that judgment seat was about at all for those who are his disciples and his followers. The word for judgment seat there is bema, B-E-M-A. That's the Greek word that's used. And that was the place the, the Olympic athletes, or at least the, uh, the, I don't know if they were all Olympic, but the early athletes went to stand before the judges to get their laurels for having won races. So it's like the Olympic stand when you get a gold medal or a silver medal or a bronze medal because you won. That would be an analogy to the Bema, okay? And so someday we're going to be called up before the judgment seat, the Bema, of the great judge of the universe, not to be fussed at, but to be decorated in front of the heavenly host for our contributions. You talk about some esteem and self-respect and all of that. You know, a Medal of Honor winner uh, in the military, excuse me, <coughs> is called to the White House to be decorated by the president. Well, let me tell you something. If you belong to God and you're one of his children and you served him, Someday you're going to come up before God Almighty and be decorated in front of the entire heavenly host for your contribution to God's kingdom. There's some self-respect. There's some self-esteem in that. God is going to sing your praises. That's his solution for that need. Number six is the need for self-governance or autonomy, the need for freedom and self-determination. Well, we're always subject to God as we should be. We're never totally in control because God's in control. And boy, I'm glad he is because he's God and I'm not. However, we have a, a form of autonomy that, that most of the world doesn't have. We have the mind of Christ, the scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians. We have been granted wisdom that even the great philosophers didn't understand. The scripture tells us we are judged by no man, but only by God, who has already declared us not guilty and, and in right relationship with him. Uh, elsewhere, it tells us we are priests and kings, all right? And so he, he takes care of this idea of self-governance -govern by loosing us from many of the strictures and pressures and all of the pressure of this world because we're working with God. We serve God. We love God. We're in God and we're in him. And therefore, we don't really have to care a whole lot what everybody else thinks about us, you know? And one time when I was working at the newspaper, I got a, a card in the mail, which turned out to be anonymous, and I'll tell you why. And, uh, but I opened it up and I pulled out this greeting card and it said, smile, Jesus loves you. And I thought, Wow, that's really nice. Somebody has sent me this really great card. Smile, Jesus loves you. And I opened up to the inside and it says, everybody else thinks you're a you know, naughty word. <laughs> and that's all it said. And clearly it was aimed at me. You know, but I thought about that later and I thought, well, that could be true. Maybe a lot of people think I am a 
but really what they think is not the final opinion. What, what really matters is not what they think, it's what the Lord thinks. And we already know what the Lord thinks because the scripture is full of him telling us that we have been accepted in him and loved in him and blessed in him and declared righteous and set apart by him. And he is a majority of one. His opinion ultimately is the only opinion that matters. Do what is pleasing to him, be obedient to him, follow him, and then it doesn't mean you'll never make a mistake, and it doesn't mean you'll never do something stupid. It doesn't mean you never have to apologize. Of course you have to apologize if you screw up and you do something stupid, but ultimately he's the one who says you're okay. And when the great judge of the universe, of the Supreme Court of the universe, has already declared you okay, then everybody else's opinion uh, is secondary or way down the line. Beyond secondary, it's beyond that. Okay, the last one is everybody has a need for significance and purpose. The need for meaning and the pursuit of a goal greater than oneself. Uh, the, Kenneth Aka, the guy who wrote the uh, website, the webmaster there says, as a fundamental human need, significance is the need to feel that our lives have meaning and that we are important. Does my life matter? And what am I here for? Well, God answers that in spades. You know, St. Paul, I keep quoting St. Paul, but he wrote half the New Testament, so you can't quote the New Testament without quoting Paul. And he says, you know, we are in the business, we have been given the mission of reconciling the whole creation to God, the Creator. He has sent us out to bring the world back into a good, happy relationship with him. We're here to proclaim the kingdom of heaven and that it has come to earth. The kingdom of heaven is here now. As the Blues Brothers said, we are on a mission from God. Well, how's that for significance and purpose? You're on a mission from God. You're sent out to tell people God loves them. He's not mad at them anymore. He wants to make friends with them. He wants to bless them. He wants to adopt them into his family. And that is significance and purpose for them but also for you because you have been given this wonderful mission from God to change your corner of the world with God's love. Amen. All seven of these are, then are fulfilled in the Lord. It's amazing to me that, as I said earlier, that 2,000 years ago in a pre-scientific, pre-social science uh, society, the writers of the Bible, under, inspired by God, understood the seven basic needs. Uh, again, in Ephesians, which we're studying, Paul says that the Lord is the everything in everything, or another translation of that says, he is all the things in all the things. He understood our psychology before there was such a thing as psychology, before anybody even knew that existed. God already understood what we needed and as human beings and had made provision to bring us into right relationship with him and consequently into right relationship with ourselves. And when we get right within ourselves through the work of the Holy Spirit, it puts us as right uh, in right standing with everybody else. Well, amen. I hope... Uh, you got something out of that this morning. I'm getting ready to pray. I see Liz coming in here. We're getting ready to do communion together. And um, this screen is backwards. I can never tell which way to <laughs> lean. Let's see. I'm going to lean over here so you can see I'll Liz. Over here. All right. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to get away from you. I'm just trying <laughs> to let everybody see your beautiful face. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll celebrate communion. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for bringing us here together today. And as we celebrate communion, let us give you thanks and praise that you knew from the beginning what we need before we even knew what we needed or knew to ask. You had already made provision. And let this communion be life 
and health and peace to us. And I praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you've got your communion kit or you've got something similar that you want to use, please join with us this morning. On the night before Jesus was crucified, he met with the disciples and they fellowshiped together and they broke bread. And as he broke the bread, he took it and he said to them on the night before he went to the cross, take eat, this is my body that is broken on your behalf. Amen. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said, This is my blood shed on your behalf. Drink this in remembrance of me. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not a big theologian. I'm not going to argue with anybody about whether when we take the, uh, the wine and the bread that we're literally taking the body and blood of Jesus or whether it's symbolic. I'll leave that to you and your pastor and your theology. But let me ask you to do this. If you celebrated this communion this morning, think of it as the body of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, and however you're able to conceptualize that, flowing through your human body today and bringing healing and peace and reconciliation to you, you personally today, that that is that Jesus in you is fulfilling your deepest needs today and give him praise and glory for that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for tuning in today. What do you think about this right here? This this <laughs> this old girl. She's all right, isn't she? <laughs> all right. All right. Miss well, you guys. Love you guys. Miss you, and we'll see you soon. Yes. Be counting the Sundays. We're we're on our way back. God bless us, everyone. Amen. Amen. We love you. See you soon. Bye, guys. Bye.